Okay, thank you very much for tuning in this week. Uh, this one's an interesting one. It's shorter than normal, but I would say, if anything, it's also more personal than uh, than most of them. Uh, as you'll hear in the introduction, this is related to Todd Doc's daughter and his recent death, and my interaction with Justin Brierley, who. Uh, is one of the people that spent a lot of time with him uh, in his last days, but also who has sort of dedicated a significant portion of his life to um, getting word out there about Todd's work. So I hope that you'll understand and appreciate this podcast and spend some time looking into Todd's work. Uh, I'll talk to you on the backside. Good morning or afternoon or whenever you happen to be listening to the podcast. Thank you so much for tuning again this week. Um, we have a very interesting guest this week. His name is Justin Brierley. I first got to uh, got introduced to him very recently. Um, uh, as you may know, uh, Todd Doc's daughter died recently, and um, it was kind of sad because I got introduced to his work by. Keith Fulton Whitman during his podcast, and I just started getting into it, and I was really enjoying it. And then I uh, I caught wind that he had he died, and so I started looking around for who might have been documenting his work, and I ran across a website called Unlocking Doc's Daughter, and it's run by Justin. And so I reached out to him; he was cool about uh, having a chat. So with that, I introduce you to Justin Brierley. Justin, how are you today? I'm good. How are you? I'm all right. Um, thank you so much for being part of the uh, part of the podcast. This is really cool. Absolutely. Thanks for having me on. Sure. Why don't we start off by having you tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Uh, so I'm primarily an electronic composer, uh, similar to Todd. Um, some of my work does get very similar. I came to work with Todd a few years ago, uh, sort of by accident. A few years ago, I returned to college to finally get my my bachelor's as an adult. And while I was there, I was working for the radio station there on campus and playing a lot of modern classical and um, classic electronic music similar to Todd's and, and in fact, playing a lot of Todd's music. And I wanted to do a, a phone interview with him. And... So I reached out to Tom Steenland from uh, Starkland Records, who have reissued most of Todd's early works. Uh, this was before I knew anything about Todd's uh, health problems. And Todd, uh, excuse me, Tom put me in touch with Todd's daughter, Tina, and things sort of progressed from there. When I first talked to Tina about four years ago, she came to the conclusion that Todd was still lucid enough at that point that, you know, he could be interviewed properly and um, still had enough of his memory intact. But there was an urgentness to it. So we we really jumped on uh, getting some interviews done. And then also while I was at school, I took a uh, a two-semester long documentary filmmaking class and that's the short film, Unlocking Doc's Daughter, that you can see on my website was, was a result of that class. So from there, it seemed a logical step to try to make a feature-length film. However, unfortunately, as much as I was able to do that one short film, I'm not really a filmmaker, and I don't really have much interest in becoming a filmmaker. And so things like raising money or finding people to help on the project that wasn't really a a skill set that I had. And so I did have a a Kickstarter uh, last October, which did not make its goal. And so the film as a feature length film is sort of in limbo at the moment until I'm hoping that somebody can come along who does have those skills, who would be able to raise the funds and hire crews and things like that uh, to make that into a feature length film. Sure, that makes that makes a lot of sense, and well, actually, congratulations to you too for sort of like 
recognizing one of your limitations and honoring that. That's cool. How did you first? Uh, how did you first run into Todd's work? <laughs> That's a funny story. It was an accident, actually. Um, I was working at a record store, and the one one day the assistant manager was doing some cleaning up, and there was this stack of records that had been sitting in the same place for like a year at least. And he looked at them and he said, oh, yeah, I remember these. This woman tried to sell them to us, but the owner didn't want them and she didn't want them back. So here, take take what you want and throw the rest away. And there was some stock housing in there and some other interesting oh things. My. <laughs> and um, there was uh, Todd Dockstadter's Quater Mass, uh, which I consider to be his his absolute masterpiece. And I hadn't heard of him at that point, but I was interested in early electronic music of that you know, time period. So I took it home because I thought, well, it looked interesting. I put it on and these strange sounds start coming out of my stereo and I'm, I'm just wondering, what is this music? And so from there, it just kind of snowballed. Eventually, I, I um, you know, did some more research into him, uh, learned about his other works, learned about his later works, the aerial box set, for example, um, which I also consider one of his great works, and just got deeper and deeper into it from there. Yeah, well, it's interesting you mentioned the Ariel set, which I have recently be a, been obsessed with. It's uh, it's amazing sonic work. Oh, and, it's and unbelievable. He, and he actually was working with some relatively crude equipment at the time, right? Well, he was working with crude equipment um, in the '60s, when he was doing Quater Mass and his other early works, um, he was basically working just with tape and oscillators. Um, he called his music "organized sound," which is a, a term he borrowed from Edgar Varese. It's an interesting term because it distinguishes it from the two main forms of electronic. You know, there was pure electronic music, like Stockhausen was doing, that was. Um, built entirely from oscillators, and then there was pure music concrete, like uh, Yusachevsky was doing, mm -hmm. which was built from just tape manipulations, right. and Todd's work combined those two. So see, there see. are tape manipulations and oscillators at work in that early work. Oh, interesting. Um, by the time he gets to Ariel, um, I'm not exactly sure how long he worked on Ariel, but I think it was in the neighborhood of 20 years. Oh, my goodness. And he did have some decent facilities of his own at that point. Um, most of those recordings were done to, to uh, digital audio tapes. And, in fact, by the time he got a computer in the early 2000s, Ariel was basically finished by okay. then. Okay, okay. Um, so I'm not exactly sure what he was, what his home studio had at that point, but I know he was using digital audio tape a lot at that point. Sure. Now, one of the things that I found I found really interesting uh, when I was kind of researching your interaction with Todd was that you ended up having access to the computer that he used for his work. Yes. Yes, um, and that is all actually bringing that up I have to take a moment to really thank Tina Todd's daughter because without her none of this would have been possible she put an enormous amount of trust in me and really welcomed me into her family in a, a very meaningful way and that trust came pretty early on in fact uh, I mentioned earlier about the sort of more formal interviews that I did with him at the very beginning back in 2011 at the end of the third one of those sessions, I had been asking her about the computer. And I was thinking that she was just going to, you know, that maybe sometime I'd go up to her house and we'd fire it up together and take a look at what was there. Um, but as we were packing up, she comes up from downstairs holding a computer tower and hands it to me and literally says, Merry Christmas. Oh, my goodness. And just trusts me to take this home and explore it. And um, it's a it's a good thing I got it when I did because the computer functioned sufficiently for a while, but then the the, the motherboard actually 
conked out. Oh. Um, so the, the hard drive is intact and all of the, the music is intact. And I have some of his uh, Adobe files, but I don't unfortunately have Adobe Audition to to open those, so I can't really look in to see what he was doing there. But but there was a lot of unreleased material on that computer. Like Like how much? Well, it's a little hard to say because there are a lot of repeats, but even counting the repeats, there's somewhere in the neighborhood of six days worth of audio. Oh my! <laughs> well, there's a there's an insane week of of listening, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so um, it's it's really interesting that you started off on this adventure just by stumbling across. Uh, across an album and a stack of tossaways yeah. and you end up getting to know his work and his family personally you spent time with him too right yes i spent a lot of time with him actually over the last few years um which was which was wonderful i mean i was in a very privileged position in that you know i got to visit him i visited him quite regularly um there were there were periods of time where I was going once a week or so. I think that for a while there he did actually he knew who I was, and I was in the privileged position of he really enjoyed my visits because uh, early on we would listen to his music mm -hmm. together, and that would um, that would bring him a lot of joy, even if he didn't entirely remember that it was his own music. Right. And then later on, um, like last year, towards the later half of the year, I had a lot of fun uh, bringing my iPad up to him and showing him how we make electronic music today. Right. And and some of the some of the apps, uh, particularly the uh, one called TC11 uh, from BitShape Software, is. An incredible uh, interface for someone uh, in his position, where because it's a multi-touch interface that takes use of the entire screen, right. and so different patches will do will behave differently, and different parameters will get changed based on you know the position of your fingers or how many fingers or whether your fingers are moving or not moving, um, and it's. A real intuitive interface and so even he was able to play with it realize like oh if I do this then it changes the sound this way and and start to actually work with it and manipulate it and it was it was fascinating and it just it brought him such joy and it was such an honor to to be able to do that now, um, what was his what was his perspective on the change? So he personally kind of witnessed an amazing range of technologies for the development of this music. Did he ever express to you like what he thought of the evolution of that? Well, it's a little bit difficult because, I mean, obviously, by the time I knew him, he was you know advancing in his Alzheimer's, and he. I kept I continually tried to explain to him that electronic music was actually popular and even out there music like his and that and that his music was popular. Hmm. Um and he never really quite understood or believed that. It's which is really unfortunate. So it's hard to say because I even tried I played other music for him by other people, you know, to show him see, look, people are doing interesting electronic music today. Right, right. Um, and it didn't, it didn't really sink in. Um, uh -huh. and, and that could be a combination of, of the Alzheimer's making it difficult for him to understand, but also the fact that he was so marginalized when he was aware of things that, he unfortunately really believed that his music had little to no worth. Mm. That's that's really interesting. I I feel horrible because I first heard of him only a few months ago when I uh, had an interview with Keith Fullerton Whitman, mm -hmm. um, who pointed to Todd's work as some of the stuff that he found most inspiring. And uh, Keith kind of mentioned that 
this is kind of an oddity because he was doing electronic music. He wasn't attached to a university system, so he didn't get right. sort of like the academic props, nor was he part of any sort of like pop culturist movement. So he didn't get those. And, and hence he kind of fell into this, I don't know, kind of he fell into this furrow in between mm-hmm. worlds and never really got props from any of them. And, and you're saying that, that he felt this very, very personally, right? Yeah, very much so. Um, many times when we would listen to his music, you know, even though he may have enjoyed it and obviously I was enjoying it with him, he'd make comments like, well, nobody's going to listen to that. <laughs> and, you know, it could... And it could have been about any of his music. It could have been his older music we were listening to, or it could have been some of the newer unreleased material. You know, it didn't really matter. Um, I think that he was very rejected, um, you know, back in the 60s and, and even through the early 70s. Um, well, I think it was somewhere in the late 60s, there were some bad reviews of his records. And he was rejected from academia. He had applied to use the facilities at Columbia Princeton, and they said no. And he took that to heart, unfortunately. And I think that's a lot of why, you know, if you look at the his output of recordings, we have these few records in the 60s, mm-hmm. and then there's nothing until... 79 and 81 when the two Boozy and Hawks records come out and then there's nothing until the early 2000s in which he puts out five records in like four years or something ridiculous like that what led to the burst of of releases and was it just that he had finished and or or did somebody jump up and and take some attention at that point the the releases in the early 2000s yeah yeah it was a combination of those things. Um, like I said, I believe Ariel was completely finished by the time he got a computer. Mm-hmm. Um, there may have been some further tweaking uh, after that. And there's actually a lot of material on the computer that are tweakings that happened after Ariel had been released. So part of that was just finding a home for that material. And that three disc set was whittled down from a much larger set of, of recordings. Oh, was it? Um, oh, okay. Yeah. So those were all done. And then the other two were collaborations with David Lee Myers, um, who David was one of the two people who encouraged Todd to get a computer. The other being, uh, Tina, Todd's daughter. Right. And so Todd and David collaborated on those two records and they actually collaborated via mail and email they only met once during the the making of those two records so how tempted are you to work you know maybe in collaboration with with his daughter how tempted are you to try and pull together some of the music that's on that computer and and make it available oh we're we're actively working on oh okay all right yeah yeah Oh yeah, we're we're actively working on that. Um, I can't name any labels at the moment, um, mm-hmm. you know, until things are a little more finalized. But I am working with two labels uh, who will be putting out material probably for a while because there is a lot of material. Yeah, well, it sounds like it. And now, how? What? Can you talk a little bit about the process of decision making that goes into working on that? I. I've always been curious about the process of working with an artist material posthumously. I mean, first of all, it's got to be it's got to be tough because you have to try and project what that person would have wanted, right? Right, right. That is a that is a great difficulty that we face. Um, in particular, um, one of the labels is going to be putting out more of a single disc that sort of the best of what's available there. Um, Although it's hard to say the best because, you know, different people have different opinions about that. In fact, you know, that label owner and I have had our disagreements about what's the best. Um, And there's also a question, particularly with this material of 
what do we consider finished? Because there are multiple versions of oh, the same pieces. Of course, of course. And so, which one do we consider finished? Um, there's not always good clues either. Um, sometimes, you know, a piece will be. The names all are just sort of jumbled things that I have to try and figure out what Todd means. Um, you know, first target clip morph vars 2.2 or something <laughs> like that. Right, right. So, um, and so a lot of times there'll be pieces where in the name it'll say final, but if I then look at date modified dates, there'll be one from much later. Right. That's after the one that's labeled final. Um, there's also some difficulty in this in that some of that material definitely stretches into the early stages of his dementia. Mm -hmm. And so it makes it very interesting as a listener, um, but it makes it difficult in terms of what's the end product here. Sure. Right. Um, right. So, so that's been a difficult process there. And then with the other label, we're looking at a more uh, deeper archive, and so we can kind of skip over some of those questions a little bit because we'll release three or four different versions of the Got same it. song, right? And, so. and then let the listener decide which one they like the best. Right. So the material you're going to kind of allow the material to re reveal itself then. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Uh, very interesting. Very interesting. When you spent time with him, you said that you're you're a composer did you get a chance to share any of your music with him i did actually um and, and what was, was what was his response well there was one time that was really kind of funny i played him a piece of mine uh called to be counted as a conch and it's the piece of mine that's the most similar to his music okay and he actually and this was, you know, because of the Alzheimer's, he actually got confused and thought it was one of his own. I see. And he's listening and he's saying, huh, I don't remember putting that sound in there. I must have had some reason. <laughs> and I said, to, I was like, no, it's all, sorry. This is, this is my music, actually. So that, that was a little awkward, and, and but kind of funny in its way. And that may have been the only time I played him some of my music. Interesting. Um, but I played a music by um, Atomic Shadow and by Autoker. Um, I believe I played him some Aphex Twin at one point. Mm -hmm. um, a few other modern composers. I actually may have played him some of Keith's music, if I recall correctly. So. And uh, and his response was? It was hard to gauge what his response was, actually. It was a little bit confusion um there may have been a bit of that same confusion where he was thinking that maybe this was his own music but he right. was just completely not remembering it sure um it was hard to tell though there, there was one time i in particular i remember where i played him a bunch of other people's music and it, sometimes he didn't verbally react much right um and so it's really hard to get any kind of feel for what he was, what he thought about it. Interesting. Now, um, how do you find his music affecting yours? So you mentioned that there's, you know, one piece that was very much like his, but do you find that, do you find that, that sort of like the, the deep interest in his work actually greatly influences your own? It's, I think it's, it's actually influencing a project that I'm working on now, um, and but more in spirit. There's something particularly about you know Quatermass, but also you know any of those early records that is so. I mean, this is it's crazy music. Right, it's really right. out there. Yeah, and and it's not afraid to be out there. <laughs> and that I think that spirit is what. I feel come into my music from Todd that I'm just going to do 
whatever I want. And if people like it, that's great. And if they don't, oh well. Um, I find that when I when I sort of like begin obsessing about someone's music, I I I think that I'm doing stuff that's overly influenced by them. But if I just let it set for a while and I come back later, I'm like, oh, I think I thought I was copying them, but it really has my own voice, you know. So I, I think that I think that influences are a really subtle and deep and curious thing. Yeah. I agree. Um, so in, in the time that you spent with Todd, what would you say is the is the thing that you learned that is most important to you now? Patience. I had to be very patient with him. And I think that that has carried through to the rest of my life. Yeah, I would say that that. Wow, that's a that's phenomenal and, and a great thing to a great thing to bring. Well, Justin, I want to thank you so much for uh, your time talking about uh, Todd's work and, and your interface with him. I know it can't be Absolutely. easy to talk about it. He, yeah, it's it's a really recent thing, and so mm-hmm. I was I was actually a little nervous about reaching out to you because. You know, knowing you had spent so much time with them, I didn't want to seem like a jackass about it, right? Yeah. But I I just know how, in a short period of time, how influential Todd's work became to me. And I wanted to be able to honor his work while, you know, while hopefully his memory is still fresh and to everybody. Absolutely. And and I'm happy to do it because really... At this point, and really, my concern all along has been just enhancing Todd's legacy, right? You know, and and I think he is uh, an overlooked person. Um, we haven't even really talked about all the other things that he did, um, which are fascinating to me. Um, you know, what? Just briefly, the the music was actually the last artistic thing that he became interested in. Before the music, he was interested in painting, he worked in cartoons, he desperately wanted to be a writer, and was a very good writer, actually, and was published later on. Um, you know, and then the whole the career making educational films, and I've seen some of those works, and they're phenomenal. Um, and so I'm happy to do something like this because anything that I can do to further his legacy, to, to get his name out there to people, to check out his work, you know, whether they check out the records or the cartoons or the writings or whatever they check out, um, he was just an incredible man, incredible. Sure. So um, it's really interesting you say that because, I mean, the – the podcast I do isn't specific about music. It's about all media types. Um, but my introduction to him was as a, as a musician, and mm-hmm. most of what I've run across the material has been about him as a musician. Where would we find more about the broader breadth of things that he had worked on? There's not a lot out there at the moment. Mm-hmm. Um, several of his articles were published by uh, a publication called Electronic Music Review. And all seven issues of EMR can be found on Ubu Web. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, so I, I forget how to get to them. I think somewhere in the left-hand column there's some something about Electronic Music Review. Sure, I'll and, try and track down a link and put that in with this so that so that the listeners can have a chance to check it out. Yeah, yeah, they, they published a few of his articles. There were a couple of um, sort of batch reviews. of he, re- he reviewed a bunch of albums together, and uh, he also wrote a very interesting article called Electronic Rock, which was about the increasing use of electronic music, electronics in rock music. This is sure. somewhere, somewhere in the late 60s. Mm-hmm. Um, 
And there was also uh, an article for New Music Quarterly. Um, that one was a rev- there, there were two articles for New Music Quarterly. Uh, one was a review of Morton Sabotnik's Wild Bull album, and the other was a review of uh, the second issue of Source Magazine, which uh, was a publication for avant-garde scores. Interesting. Well, I'm going to try and track some of those down and share those links. Um, do me a favor, too, in, um, as some of these releases come to fruition, please reach mm-hmm. out and let me know about them. Or, Absolutely. Um, you know, if you come up with, you know, if you put together something for maintaining a mail list or something about in, people interested, let me know because I know that for myself, I've become a huge fan, obviously very late to the game, but... Um, still, it's I've I've become a huge fan, but I know a lot of other people have, either are or have become, uh, have have become very interested in his work, and so I want to make sure that um, I do what I can to keep help keep his uh, his legacy on people's radar. Absolutely. Well, thank you so much. I really appreciate your time. I appreciate your willingness to talk about this and uh, to talk openly to the listeners as well great again thanks for having me on all right thank you so much and we'll talk to you soon thank you okay and there you have it um it's kind of difficult it was seems so personal and uh, really very touching, but I hope that you take the opportunity to uh, look into some of Todd's work, both his music as well as some of his other media work. Um, I interact with Todd's music through Spotify, uh, and they have a lot of his work there. So if you need, that's a place to go and look. I'm sure other digital sites have it as well. Uh, Starkland Records is uh, is responsible for his recent reissues, so you can check that out. Um, but in general, spend some time looking into this. I put uh, uh, I put the link for Unlocking Doc's Daughter on the uh, on the website for the podcast, so you might want to check that out, as well as checking out more of Justin's story on his website. So thank you very much for listening this week. Um, if you have any questions or comments, drop me a line, ddg at cycling74.com or darwin.gross at gmail.com. I, as always, look forward to hearing from you. If you've got ideas, let me know. Um, Sometimes I get a little swamped, so if I don't write back, don't think that that I didn't see your email. Um, It just might be that I'm a little swamped. But otherwise, thank you so much for listening, and I'll catch you again next week. Bye.